Looks like we've got people joining us now. I'll give everyone a couple of minutes just to get in. Good afternoon, everybody. Nice to see you all. Right, I will make a start if everyone's ready. So uh, thank you everybody for joining today. Uh, we've got a really good attendance for today's session, so I'm really looking forward to getting started. Um, just want to introduce myself first of all. So my name is Michael Grime and I'm a Senior Project Manager for Truman Change. And I just want to officially welcome you to our March 2024 edition of our Change Chat. Um, for anyone that's not been to one of these sessions before, just to let you know how they work, is that we pick a particular topic, uh, pull together uh, an excellent panel or speaker as we've got with Lucy today. And then we provide you with tips and expertise on, on that topic. Um, we want these sessions to be really, really informal, uh, but also very interactive. So if you have any questions throughout, please feel free to unmute yourself, put your hand up or uh, put a question in the chat, which uh, I will be monitoring throughout today's session. Um, as you may have noticed, we, we do record these and... Um, Everybody who's booked onto the session will receive a copy of the recording. So if for any reason at all you you have to leave or uh, you want to share the recording with every, anybody following the event, you're more than happy to do so. And also we will be putting the recording on our website, which is www.trumanchange.co.uk, our YouTube page, and we'll also be on our social media channels. So as, I've, I've, as I mentioned before, the recording, um, sorry, this will be recorded. Uh, but the recording will only pick up those who are speaking. Um, that's just how we we set it up. So if if for any reason you don't want to be recorded and you have a question, as I say, just pop it in the chat and it'll be picked, picked up there. So today's session is um, titled Doing Change Well. And I am delighted to say that we're joined by the founder and managing director of Truman Change, Lucy Truman. And Lucy will be talking to you today about her recent research into organisational change in the public sector post-COVID uh, and the pandemic. So Lucy, everything we're going to talk about today, Lucy has compiled the findings into a report. And um, we are delighted to say we'll be able to share a copy of that report following the change chat today. So Lucy, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I wondered if you'd just like to start by introducing yourself to people and... Um, Briefly, briefly give a bit of an explanation about the research that you've done before we dive into the actual findings. Sure. I do just want to say that literally 10 minutes ago, I had a power cut, which went off everything, and then everything came back on at 2 minutes to 12. So if I disappear, I have got my phone ready, and I will just jump back on via my phone. So so please bear with us if I do something here. Those of you who know me will know that I live out in the middle of nowhere, up on the moors between uh, Blackburn and Rossendale, so things are a little bit precarious sometimes with basic utilities, but we are here and hopefully um, hopefully it's all sorted and I will be with you for the full hour without any interruption. Um, so I'm Lucy, I'm the founder of Truman Change. Truman Change is 10 years old this year, which is really, really shocking to me because it feels like it's about 10 minutes old, not 10 years. Um, and we, so my personal background um, or professional background is project and program management and change management in the public sector. I've done a bit in the police, a little bit in the health, but most of my work has been in local government. And I have always been a slightly rebellious project manager. I've always not followed all of the rules perfectly um, and always felt that sometimes they can be a little bit restrictive. Uh, and I moved around, worked, started out uh, in a council, then went freelance and worked in a variety of different councils on lots of different change programs. And then COVID hit. So when COVID hit, um, it, it hit me personally, as it hit many, many people personally, in the firstly, obviously I had my own business, so that was quite a scary time. And secondly, on the 3rd of April, I lost my dad to COVID, um, which was right at the start. So that was April 2020. So just as we were all got into lockdown and, and were dealing with that sort of shock, um, unfortunately, I lost my dad to COVID. And I think part of the almost therapy of processing all of that was to try and look for some good because you couldn't really engage with the world in a way that ignored COVID. You couldn't really dip your toe back into the working world at that point. And so I thought, well, from my professional background, 
what's interesting here is there is a phenomenal amount of change happening within the public sector and it's happening extremely quickly and nobody's using a PRINCE2 manual. So let's use this as an opportunity to learn. So what started four years ago with that question and then became some informal conversations, then a series of change chats like this through the pandemic where we invited different panellists to come and talk about how they were making change happen so quickly, became a bit more formal. I drafted a book, which I'm editing at the moment and hoping to publish uh, later this year. And then last year, I took a year out of client work to do a full-time master's in organizational psychology with Birkbeck Uni in London. And my research project was, again, asking that question, how did, so specifically councils, how did councils manage to make change happen so quickly during the pandemic? And now that we're three or four years out of that, what, what are the lessons from that? So it's been a bit of a personal crusade now for the last four years and one that I fully intend to continue. So I'm hoping to, once my book is published, then um, go back to uni and do a PhD and just continue the same research project because it's something that, and, and I know I'm bringing some personal baggage to the table with my own grief, but I, I just feel so passionately that it's a real opportunity for change professionals and public sector professionals and potentially wider because I think a lot of the learning is very transferable to really think about how we do change because when we had to do it very quickly, we didn't use any of the methodologies that we all deem to be good practice in change. So, so yeah, it's been a bit of a personal crusade and we're sort of at a point now where because I've done the masters um, and the book is drafted that we're, I'm able to kind of summarize it and provide some of that information in a more concrete way. So we thought rather than our usual format of a panel discussion of a change chat for this one, it would be a nice one to launch the latest report and share where my thinking is at. But also, as Michael said, we'd really like this to be very informal. I'm not tied into my PhD yet. So any feedback on what you where you think I should take this research next would be interesting. And of course, please do share your own stories and reflections of, of how you're doing change in your organization. Is that, a, is that a good summary, Michael? That's, that's a great summary. <laughs> so you've, you've kind of touched on it a, a little bit from what you were saying, but before we actually get into the nitty gritty of your research and your findings, why is now the the right time to be looking at, at change? I know you've touched on it a little bit, but you can expand on so, it. So I think there's a few reasons. I think firstly, um, I had a couple of people say to me when I was interviewing formally through my master's that now is a good time because there has been enough time passed that people are now able to get into a reflective state. We were in a fight or flight, extremely reactive state um, as a result of the pandemic for quite some time. And some people would say we're still in that. Uh, but I feel like we're at a point now where we are, you know, we're still working through that transition into back to normal. And there's an awful lot of conversation around hybrid working and so on. But I, I feel like we are now able to be in more of a reflective space. So I, and I think that it's it's enough distance to enable us to reflect but it's still soon enough to take some of that learning. And I think that there is a risk in the desire to rush back to normal that we lose some of that good stuff. So I think now is a really, really important time to capture that. But also, you know, it's easy to feel like, and I think this probably isn't reflective of people in the sector, because I think people in the sector are definitely in the weeds of it. But those outside the sector might be forgiven for thinking that, you know, now things have almost calmed down. But actually, in the public sector, COVID was just one, one crisis. We are now having to deal with the cost of living crisis, there's climate emergency, budgets is just getting tougher and tougher and tougher. So there's, and technology and, you know, the, the way that society is, people are living longer. So there's this, although that was an immediate crisis, it is the role of the public sector to respond to the needs of the public. And those needs are constantly, constantly changing. So I, I think that, you know, probably the first reflection is that we've got to stop thinking of change as something that is additional to business as usual. Change is actually part of our jobs all the time as public sector leaders. We have to be able to lead change because we have to be able to respond to, to, to the needs of the public. And I 
I don't know if this is a bit of an emotive response because I work, I've obviously had Truman change for 10 years and before that I was in the public sector for about 12. It doesn't feel like, even though we've just come out of a pandemic, it doesn't feel like we're taking the foot off the gas in terms of having to constantly rethink how we work. So I just think it's really important to, as well as be in the weeds of responding to those needs, also be able to reflect on if if change is just going to be constantly with us, how do we get really good at it? Yeah, absolutely. Some really good points there. So now diving into your research a little bit, I want to start at the beginning. So I know from me, from I've read your report and it's it's brilliant. So looking forward to everybody else reading it. So just want to talk about pre twenty twenty. Um, so can you explain what you found when you were reflecting on pre COVID and pre twenty twenty? What how were how were local authorities working? So I think that. Pre-2020, so if we walk through like the sort of history of change, if you will, um, what what people sort of really got a grip of in terms of how to do change was project management. Now, project management, and I and I started out as a project manager in the public sector. Project management is a brilliant tool for enabling you to get some structure around some activity that needs to happen. And it's designed with a sort of beginning and end in mind. So a project is something that you do on top of what your normal service delivery is, and it has clear outputs and it has a, a, an end in mind. Um, so it was really sort of taken to by the public sector of, okay, this is how we're going to do change. What I think it's worth reflecting on about that is whilst that structure and taking the time to think about what it is that you want to achieve is really, really important, Project management as a discipline was not designed with change in mind. It was designed by engineers. So when we talk about Gantt charts, Gantt was, that's named after an engineer. So it was a whole methodology that was around control and making sure that things were done to budget and in the right order and on time. And in fact, PRINT stands for Projects in a Controlled Environment. So there's a challenge there at quite a fundamental level of is changing social care a controlled environment? Now, yes, on the one hand, we need certain things to be in control. We need to be statutory. We need to make sure that we're following certain processes. But also, you wouldn't necessarily, knowing that history, think, yes, I will apply the same methodology to changing the way social workers work as you would to <clears throat> building a bridge where if, you know, the nuts and bolts aren't in the right place, the bridge is going to come down. So, so that, that's the first thing that, that, that came into play. People began to notice then that it was lacking in what people describe as the people side of change. So the people side of change being things like phrases you'll have heard, like, you know, the change curve and winning hearts and minds and making sure that people are kind of behind and engaged with the change. Now, that was a good observation. But what happened there was the consultants jumped in. So a lot of the methodology around change that was designed to fill the gap in project management came from consultants. Now, speaking as one, what consultants love is to design something very simplistic that they can sell to a lot of people. Now, I like to think that we're a bit more nuanced than that and that we make more of an effort than that. But it would be naive to, to ignore that, that that is the driver for a lot of consultants. So a lot of the change management methodology, you know, John Cotter was a consultant. He wasn't an academic. And there's a number of them, you know, Prosky developed as a consultancy model. So there's a risk there that they are um, overly simplistic because they're designed to be. But also, if you look at them critically, which is what I did through my master's, you, you will notice that they still have this underlying assumption that change is a process. So it's a series of steps that you go through. And the assumptions around those steps have again been borrowed from different professions and different specialisms. So the change curve was not a change management model. It was a model for how people respond to being told that they're terminally ill. So what the, what the change management profession has done is it's borrowed different things from different models 
and potentially, in my opinion, oversimplified them. And what these models tend to have in common is number one, they're sequential in their process. So they, they are, we follow these steps. So, so the change curve, we all go through this at the same in the same way. It's not true. And the second assumption that underlies all of them that I disagree with is that change management appears to have come from a place of seeing the gap in project management and what caused seeing that gap was resistance. So almost all change management models have at their heart that their job is to reduce resistance. Now, that's an interesting starting point. And I'm not saying that resistance to change, it doesn't exist. Of course it does. But I, I think it's an interesting starting point. It's not about getting to the outcome. It's about reducing the resistance. So I think that's that's worth challenging. So you've then got this kind of mismatch of some project management, some change management, that comes through in people. So it comes through in that they're different qualifications. So you have change managers and project managers. Finding people that understand both are like gold dust. I know because I'm trying to recruit people like that. So, so you've got this leaning and this tension between two groups of people, which isn't necessarily that effective. And then in the public sector world, we've got huge complexity, high risk, often massive budgetary pressures. So there's this desire to be able to oversee and control, which comes from an absolutely right place. We absolutely need to make sure that we're being good value for taxpayers' money and all of those important things and legally safe. So we brought in PMOs. Now, what PMOs do is they oversee change. And I see a real range of them in terms of some that are a group of brilliant change people that can roll the sleeves up and dabble in all of those words worlds pull from all those tools and apply really good thinking right through to the other end of the spectrum which is where it's a policing role and we even use words like gateway so we're literally gatekeeping change and it becomes about administering change instead of delivering it so if you look at the sort of development of how that's happened over, say, 40 years, you can see why we may have lost our way and we may not be that as good at change as we need to be because we're juggling all these different professions and all these different schools of thought. And we're often not even aware that we're juggling them. So, you know, it it comes down to personal preference. So if you get somebody in a leadership role that's really strong on project management, they will push that methodology. If you've got somebody that's really strong on people side, they'll push that methodology. And you can see how they're just sort of not quite fitting and at odds. Is that a, a fair summary? Yeah, ab absolutely. Absolutely. And I think it moves us on to, you know, the next point there. So you, you've talked about pre-2020. So what's changed now? What are councils want, in your opinion, and from your conversations and your research, what are councils wanting to change now? So in terms of what's driving change in councils, it's all the stuff that we already know. And it's the stuff that we've talked about. So, you know, budgetary pressures, massive, massive issues. And, you know, we've been on at this now for, I don't know, somebody political will know more than me, but it feels like about 15 years. We've been on at this, save money, save money, save money. And to some degree, absolutely, we need to be cost effective. But it's it's getting to a point where there's only so much salami slicing we can do. And there's only so many big massive transformation programs we can do because often because of all the reasons I've just described they don't quite hit the mark um technology and I think that that is just moving faster than any of us can really keep up with and I don't just mean from the perspective of the relationship with the workforce and working from home but you know we're trialing at the moment for the last two weeks and um, Microsoft pilot in Truman Change just as a small business we're trialing it and honestly it's blowing my mind and I, I hear of councils that are talking about how can we use AI to run planning processes? You know, how can we use AI to change the way that we do care? So, you know, you've got all of this technology stuff that's driving change. Politics, I mean, local government is really at the front face of politics because you're juggling the national picture and the local picture. And so juggling different needs of different parties. And I have to say, I don't want to get into politics because it's not my field. And I'm sure we could all rant lots about it. But, you know, it's been a period of a number of years of significant instability where we've seen a lot of councils that have been under stable political leadership for a long time change. So you've got all that change going on. You've got the society changes going on. So people are living longer. 
Um, so it's impacting care services, but also it's interesting looking at younger generations who are less likely to be interested in a secure full time permanent role. So we're having to juggle all of these different what's the future of the workplace look like, um, which lots of councils I speak to are looking at what their employee value press proposition is you know how do we become an employer of choice in this market of massive recruitment crisis so so there's there's literally a list as long as your arm of what's driving change um what i am seeing though is an increased maturity in change which is really refreshing so post covid people are beginning to um so i used to feel like pre covid i was a bit of a lone voice in the dark when i talked about culture and culture was seen as this sort of magical fluffy fairy dust thing that lived in the air that nobody had any real control over i'm seeing a much more mature approach to culture now where people are better able to describe their culture and they're better able to describe what their culture needs to be and they're getting better at linking their change and transformation programs to that so people are starting to rather than just say we need to save x y and z they're now saying well we need to save x y and z which means we need to change this these three things which means our culture needs to change in this way and this is how we're going to do it so i see a greater depth but what i also see is a, a massive lack of resource both from a literally resource level, but also from a, a, a capacity level, a capability level. And um, so both capacity and capability, because we just don't have enough good people that understand change. But what I'm also seeing, and I don't want to do myself out of a business here, but I think we need to move away from change being someone's job, because that and I think PMOs have driven this quite significantly. A lot of councils have set up change teams or PMO teams where, you know, here is our change experts when actually, do we not all need to be change experts? So I'm seeing a, an increase in councils wanting to think about how do we do change well? How do we make sure that our business as usual leaders are able to do that rather than almost just, well, I'm just going to carry on running the council and these people over here doing this sexy new change program can do what they want, but it doesn't affect me. That isn't going to work anymore. Um, so yeah, I've seen quite quite a lot of things. Um, I can see there's a question about what what my definition of culture is. My definition of culture is that it is how um, how messages are cascaded around an organisation, and my way of working with culture is a little bit maverick, but I look for contradictions. So if I was working with a council on culture, what I would say is describe to me what you want your culture to be. Then I would go out and find evidence of where it's not, which can seem like it's a bit of a negative starting point. But I just think a lot of people, too many people think that the key to changing culture is to just put some new values up, put a new brand up and hope for the best. You have to if you if you think of it in terms of it's how messages are received by the staff, then you have to find the contradiction in messages. And those contradictions in messages come through the form, of, well, any messaging comes through the form of behaviour of leadership, behaviour of, of the workforce. That's what people are normally talking about. They normally, when they say, I want cultures to change, they mean I want the behaviour of that group of people over there to change. That's normally what they mean. But it's also what messages are you sending through your systems, through your processes, what messages are you sending through your habits and your rituals and the stories that are told. So it goes much deeper than just behavior. Um, so a really good example recently, I was asked to look at how integrated a culture was in terms of a social care and health integrated frontline service and they've not yet integrated their IT systems so with the best will in the world you can call it integrated as much as you want and I know it's not easy integrating the IT systems that's a job nobody wants to do but on a day-to-day -day basis when those staff are working they are not able to access each other's information so it is not integrated it doesn't matter what you call it it, it is not integrated 
And it's looking for those contradictory messages and dealing with those contradictory messages that makes the difference with culture change. And that's how you accelerate culture change. A lot of people think, you know, new leadership, new brand, new logos, new kind of values and a few workshops with staff. You've got to you've got to find the contradictions, because if it's about messaging, then you want all your messaging lined up. That's that's how I would define it. But do feel free to share your own definitions because it is it is something I studied quite a bit in my master's. And there's a lot of different definitions of culture, which is part of the problem (laughs) because it means different things to different people. No, absolutely. And I worked with you on that, as you know, on that social care work. And yeah, it was really interesting to to see all that in the, in the background going on. So thank you, Claire, for your question. And if anybody has any more that they, they'd like to add, please feel free to um, to add them to the chat. So if I'm looking at driving change in my organisation and I'm, I'm, I'm a key advocate to change, and I really want to make, you know, start pushing that out and make a difference. What tips do I need to consider? So I I think the first thing is, I think there needs to be a bit of a shift from thinking of change as a process. So stop thinking it of a series of steps that we go through. Absolutely do your project plan so you know what steps you're going to go through. I'm not saying don't do any of that. But the art of change is not adherence to a process. The art of change is the ability to read the room and adjust your style. So the other thing that I'm seeing that is quite a significant change is that people are not necessarily wanting a strict methodology to adhere to. They want leaders who have the skill to navigate change and support others through that rather than implement a process. So what does that mean in real terms? So it means you need to have the ability to decide where you are on spectrums at any given point. So instead of saying, okay, we're here on the change curve, we've got to now go through anger. What you've got to be able to do is say, right, when do I need to go fast? And when do I need to go slow? And the answer to that will be different in at different points in the same change journey, in the same organization, never mind in different organizations. So you need to have the skill to be able to figure out, firstly, the pace of change, Secondly, the amount of governance that you need. So the other mistake that we make is we bring in something like Prince2 or any, you know, there's five or six different ones. It doesn't really matter which one you use, but we bring something like that in and we try and force everything through that same level of governance. Think tight and loose. You know, there are times if you're doing something in children's social care, then that's going to need governance because you know what? You've got no matter how lovely you want the world to be, you might get inspected by Ofsted. So there there are parts of the council and parts of change programs where your governance needs to be really, really strong. But there are parts when it doesn't. And so it's the ability to decide when that is and apply that judgment similarly there will be times in a change program where you need to be quite directive during covid there were some of the things i don't want to say the government was not directive because i don't think they were (laughs) there was a lot of mixed messages going on but we'll not get into that but you know there was a we've all got to work from home from monday now that level of direction changed the conversation from We want an agile, working, flexible space that nobody knew what it meant. Two, we've all got to work from home by Monday. Okay, we're clear. So there are times when you need to be super clear and give that mandate. There are times, and and this happened too in the pandemic, where it's a case of, okay, we don't know exactly how we're going to get there. So let's get a few people around the table. Let's engage with whether it's your residents, whether it's your service users, whether it's your staff. But, you know, how do we how do we do this in a co-produced way that meets everybody's needs? And what I saw in the pandemic was this, you know, seeing both of those ends of the spectrum at any given time, you know, there was huge amounts of governance around emergency planning. But then there were some things that happened during the pandemic that had very little governance that were just everybody roll your sleeves up and do what you can. There were times when it was extremely directed. There were times when it was massively co-produced and brilliant, brilliant outcomes as a result. So I think we've got to move away from this rigid approach and we've got to skill our leaders up to be able 
to apply those judgments and that that is what came through very very strongly not so much at the beginning when I was in the pandemic doing the research then it was all about how fast everything was happening but when I did my master's interviews last year that came through very strongly chief execs no longer want an overly prescriptive approach to change what they want are people who can navigate through all of that and almost view it as spinning plates that you decide oh that's wobbling a bit we might need a bit more there or that's not wobbling or we might need a bit more of this here you know that ability to be able to adjust your style so that's not necessarily a tip because it's an almost rethink the whole thing entirely. But I, I do think that's needed and I'd be and I'd be welcome to hear um other people's on the call's thoughts on that as to how would they feel that's possible. The the issue with that, and I was at yesterday, um, I was in Newcastle at the Changing Futures conference, um, which was really good. And if you're not familiar with what they're doing at Gateshead Council, they've got a range of partners and they are trialing um, different ways of delivering service. They had Hillary Cotton speak, they had Donna Hall speak, it was a great conference. Um, but one of the things that we were talking about there was that we almost train managers out of this type of skill. So, you know, people come into the sector and we celebrate and train people in the ability to provide stability, consistency, safety, follow a process. And then we chuck them in a world of change where they almost need the opposite. They almost need to move away from all of that and be able to be more creative. So I think that's a significant challenge at the moment is how do we change, how do we train managers that we've trained in stability and business as usual to be able to free themselves of those shackles in an environment where they can't entirely free themselves from those shackles. Because as I said, you know, whether it's Ofsted, whether it's CQC, whether it's the social housing regulations, we, we are you know we, we do have obligations to meet so we can't just do what we want there is an element of what is safe and what is legal um but yeah that tension between those two things at the moment of moving away from a place of control and towards a place of empowerment i think is a is a significant challenge for councils right now yeah great um another so i know you've touched on culture quite quite a few times during this so if I'm looking at driving change in, in my organisation, what do I need to know and what do I need to understand and how do I go about understanding and knowing about the culture within my organisation? What are the best ways to do that? So we use a model um, which I think was um, somebody called Taylor invented. Um, it's a simplified version of if you're if you're really into culture, Edgar Schein is like the godfather of culture and has done lots of work and lots of books. And he actually passed away last year. Um, but really, I would really recommend. However, that's quite at the academic end of the spectrum. And he came up with a list of eight artifacts. We use a simpler, a simplified version of that where we look at three, just because eight is too much for most people. But it's basically going back to that definition of think about messaging. And the power of thinking about messaging is it's less personal. So if you're thinking about messaging, there will be blind spots. You know, there's lots of blind spots of culture in big organizations. One of the most common examples I talk about, and it's from a few years ago, is um, a council that wanted to make their culture to be much more. Oh, don't ask me how to spell Edgar Schein's surname. <laughs> Google that, Michael. I think it's S-C-H-E-I-N, but it might be I-E-N. Um, but the... Yeah, somebody else has responded. Thank you. The if you think about it in terms of messaging, then it's much more it's much more objective and it takes it away from you're a bad leader. So an example would be I, I worked with an organization that wanted to reduce silo working and they wanted their managers to be much more able to sort of work across different projects and programs and work together better. One of the blind spots that we found there was in their job evaluation process, they were actually paying people and rewarding people based on how many staff they managed. So you say you want to move away from like an empire building culture, but you're literally paying people to empire build. Now, that was never a deliberate decision. It was obviously just a blind spot and, and it was something that was fixable. But it's looking for those blind spots is where the magic is at, because they're the things where you're sending contradictory messages 
and you don't even know you're doing it. So I find that a very powerful framing for culture. What we do is our three categories of messages that we look for is behavior, where we ask people, tell us about leadership behavior, tell us what you see people doing. So we ask loads of open questions and we run workshops where we it's a very qualitative approach and we do thematic analysis on it. Um, the second category is systems and processes, which the job evaluation one was a really good example of that. The process of job evaluation is driving a certain behavior. And the health and social care example, the IT systems is driving a set of behaviors. So you're there looking at where are the hardest stuff, the systems, the processes, the ways of working, how are they driving behavior, which is and what message are they sending as part of your culture? And then the third one, which is a little bit more wishy-washy, is um is basically um sort of habits and rituals and symbols so where do things symbolize something and that can be the stories that are repeatedly told so i worked with one organization that wanted to be less risk averse but the story that was repeatedly told by senior managers or the question that was repeatedly asked was we've always got to think what does this look like if it ends up in the Daily Mail? Now, that's not a bad challenge. And lots of us have to think, you know, as public sector organisations, what happens if it ends up in the Daily Mail? But by constantly going back to that question, you're sending a very risk averse message. So you see how things can symbolise things. So we run um, workshops with staff. To, and we don't necessarily go into the theory of culture because no one cares. What we do is we ask the open questions around those things and then we pull that out and that enables us to start to come up with an action plan to say, okay, well, if this is what you want your culture to be, here are all the ways in which it's not. And that gives you then a list of real tangible actions to take to change the culture instead of just putting some posters up and hoping for the best. So it, it can be seen as a bit of a negative starting point to look for the contradictions. And we're not always that honest about that that's what we're doing just because we don't want it to become like a bit of a bum fight in the meetings. But that is what we're doing. We're looking for, this is what we're trying to build, what's stopping people from getting there. And I, I just think that's so powerful. And it's and it's underdone. People think that they can sort of overly positively do this. You need the positive. The, the, the answer is three things. You've got to flood with positive messages, get rid of the negative messages or the messages that are not contradictory. And you've got to train your managers in it so that your managers understand that concept of, I am building the culture by messaging. So how do I? And that it empowers your managers to take control of it then. Great stuff. Thank you. We've uh, had a couple of questions. So I'm just going to start from the, with the one from May. Uh, how would you promote and shift the mindset of local government workforce from one of changes the program being run by someone else to changes embedded in everyone's ways of thinking, working in finding, driving opportunities for continual improvement? Well, isn't that the million dollar question? If you can figure that out, you can come and work for us. <laughs> I, I think that. So I think that firstly, it is that culture. So it's that it's it's the process that I just talked about. So I would start there. I would start with where is where is the anti-change messages in this organization? And I am pretty sure we would find hundreds because one of the another really interesting psychological concept that I really want to get into, and I've actually got a meeting with um a sports psychologist next week who who who's done a lot of work in this kind of field, is I call it cats and cheese. So it's um people have individual differences in terms of how motivated they are by risk or reward. And the reason why I call this cats and cheese is because the experiments that were done to come up with this theory were done on rats and mice. And the logic was that some of them were more sensitive to the smell of cats, which is a threat. And some of them are more sensitive to the smell of cheese, which is a reward. And that's true of people too. And some people like myself, they can measure this. You can do like questionnaires and they can measure it. Um, I am highly sensitive to both, which means I'm an emotional wreck because I'm constantly chasing something exciting but scared of it going wrong. And then there are some people that are not particularly motivated by either. They sort of stay steady and stay their course. Now, the reason why this is interesting at an organizational level, particularly if you're talking about change, is that you're going to have different drivers there. So you're going to have some people that are motivated by their ability to reduce risk for an organization. So if we were being completely stereotypical about that, 
we would say, you know, people that tend to be drawn to services such as procurement. Procurement is a service which is fundamentally about reducing risk. It's about making sure that we're compliant, keeping the organization safe. And then you'll have people that work in regen that are really motivated by cheese. They just want to go out and build new things and change the world. Then you'll have people in social care that are motivated by both. So, you know, they, they will be motivated absolutely by making a difference to children's lives. But they've also got a pretty scary cat in the form of Ofsted on the back. So I'd be looking for if you were going to try and make officers more in a space where they're positive about change, I'd be understanding some of that. I'd be doing that culture piece to say, where is the organization actually communicating to its workforce that it's anti-change and I would be fixing some of that and then I'd be training those leaders in all of this sort of stuff that we're talking about because they need to understand that concept and messaging in order for them to be more accepting and they need to see some positive examples and we need to reduce the messaging that's saying that we're anti that or at least shed light on it because the cats and cheese thing is not about demonizing one or the other it's about asking the organization as a whole so if we were if we were scared of cats what would we be thinking right now if we were chasing cheese what would we be thinking right now okay so let's put ourselves in those different mindsets it's about understanding that relationship with risk rather than getting rid of it entirely um but yeah i would it starts with the culture and i'm really conscious of one of my favorite sayings is to someone with a hammer everything looks like a nail and i really don't want to be that person about culture but the older i get and the more experienced i get a lot of it i just keep coming back to do you know what it's it's such a good starting point we can say all the things that we want but what are we actually communicating and often we there's so many blind spots and we're communicating the opposite of what we say we want Great, thank you. We've got another question from Sherelle. So she said, I have been in my programme for 12 months and gone with an empowerment approach from the off. I wonder if it's time to move to more directive due to the challenges. How do you manage the culture when you have to move between the uh, those two modes, particularly if culture is a blocker already? So I would be transparent about it. And, you know, Michael can back me up on this, but I, I'm very transparent with my team when I am in directive mode and when I'm not. And, and we will say, you know, this is going on in the business right now. So for this, we're going to be super directive and this is what we're going to do. And then there'll be other times in the business where I say, okay, you know what? It's over to you guys. Everybody figure this out themselves. So that it's okay to be transparent about the need to, to switch between them. But also don't always see it as a switch. Sometimes it's an and. So sometimes you may find, so using COVID and the remote working, the directive was everybody has to work from home by Monday, but it was incredibly co-produced how we got there. You know, it really was, okay, let's chat to the IT guys. Let's chat to some people in different services. Let's all figure out how we can make this work together. So you can be both. You can be directive about where you're going and what needs to happen, but then be very empowering about the how you get there. And that that is a generally a good starting point because sometimes if you try and get it to be too and, and there will be people that disagree with me on this but if you try and make it too co production about the what that's when you get this like management by committee and you struggle to nail it so sometimes it's better to be super directive about where you're going but then co-produce the how um but in terms of where you say culture is a challenge i'd again you know <laughs> being the person with the hammer and the nail i'd again think about that through that process that i said of those three categories what what do you see happening and sometimes there is a benefit this isn't a pitch but sometimes there's a benefit to somebody not as close doing that because they will see the blind spots because they because they're not embedded in it um but yeah understand when you say the culture is not good really start to define and find the examples of where the culture is the opposite to what it needs to be and find out why and fix it. Thank you very much. We've got another question. They're coming in. They're all coming in now. <laughs> so uh, it starts with a compliment. So find your approach so refreshing, Lucy. So um, mm -hmm. Levi Strauss's definition of culture, super old, but st still fits, sees culture as systems, kinship, mythology, art, religion, rituals, culinary and culinary traditions, which maps onto our present onto your present day. How do you bridge the gap between public sector leaders developing skills outside of the profession that has usually made them leaders? How do you bridge? I don't quite understand. Um, oh, do you mean in terms of because we've taught them to be leaders in a different way? 
Um, That's how I read it. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I I think I think what I mean. So it's super clear. Sorry, that probably wasn't written very clearly. Often I'll work with. Let's say I'm working with I don't know an investment manager, and we're asking him to look at culture or to do somebody's appraisal, and he might say, "Look, I'm not an HR person." I'm an investment guy, so I don't do that. It's that kind of thing that I face as a challenge for all the different disciplines that we work with. Yeah, and that that is a challenge. And um, I think so. It depends on the on the culture of the organisation, and I do see a difference. So I work predominantly with councils, and I do see a real difference between councils as to where specialism lies and to how much. Um, services like HR are used or relied on. So there are some organisations where it's very much a transactional self-service model. And then there are some where HR is very much a partner to managers. Um, I think it's about understanding where they need to get to. And sometimes there is a case of looking at what is the role of a manager. And I have done that with some organisations where it's like, okay, we have to define what is the role of a manager within this organisation, within this context. I do think that is really important. Um, the other way is that the results do speak for themselves. So if you can get a couple of people that are more open to this more sort of human centered way of working, generally speaking, they will be more successful. So it becomes it's seen to be a, a skill that's needed. Simon Sinek, who I'm, I'm not as big of a fan of as I used to be, but he does talk quite a lot about how we call things soft skills that are actually really core important skills, um, which I do totally agree with. So we have this view that people stuff is soft skills and it's actually the opposite. That should be considered the hard skill and that the softer skills are the technical skills. Um, I see a very common issue where people are promoted in whatever their profession is because they're good technically. And, you know, somebody that is a brilliant social worker may not be a good public leader, um, a, a good team manager. And I think that we need to get clearer about Has Lucy gone for everybody else or is it just me? She's gone for everybody else. Oh, Lucy, you're back. <laughs> I've just had a message to say my connection is unstable. Yeah, go um, back about 15 seconds. <laughs> don't keep track of time. Um, I think, was I talking about leadership and management? I, I don't think that that's necessarily always a helpful distinction because it positions leadership as very sexy and management as very boring. And again, it's creating these opposing ends when actually we need to be able to do both. So to be a good manager, you need a good technical understanding of what you have to deliver. You don't necessarily need to be an expert in it. You need to be a good manager in that you need to be able to provide that stability and routine and this is how things work. But you also need to be a good leader in times of change. So I think it's just broadening the definition of what leadership and management is um, because it absolutely... It, it's it's really disheartening as a change professional when when you're brought into an organization and you feel like that lone voice because you're fighting against the the middle management layer who don't perceive this to be their job i think we've really got to think about how we are training managers and leaders in change and we're teaching them these skills when they're young and when they're just coming into the profession instead of you know kind of celebrating someone's technical ability and then giving them work and expecting them to do stuff that we haven't really taught them how to do. Um, I'm not sure I have the answer of exactly how you teach them yet because I feel like I'm in the state where I'm rethinking how to do change completely myself anyway. Um, but I reckon within a year or two, we'll have much better understanding of that and we'll be able to provide some guidance and leadership. But it's it's investing in your middle managers. That you, we're giving them a very difficult job to do. And I, I can't speak in the investment community, but in public sector, we're giving them an almost impossible job to do because we 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 celebrate them and promote them through technical ability. We put them through some sort of manager training program that will undoubtedly cover things like how to have difficult conversations and how to manage a budget. And it's it's rarely covering any of the stuff that we really need them to do.
Right. Thank you. Uh, we're hitting our last 10 minutes. So if anybody has any further questions that they'd like to ask, please uh, put your hand up or, or pop them in the chat. So as we're coming towards the end, and I know you've mentioned lots of helpful tips and expertise there, which uh, I hope everyone's found very, very useful. If you had one main tip for people who want to go away and drive change forward in their organisation, what would that be? I think it would be to tailor your approach. So just get critical. Right? And, and if you have the time and the ability, learn a little bit about everything. So learn a bit about change management, learn a bit about project management, learn a bit about different models, but then pick and choose from them. So don't fall into the trap of, of imposing a methodology. That would be my biggest tip. Um, my second tip after that would be culture. In fact, I'd probably swap it around and I'd do culture first. Learn and understand how culture works and operates and how you shape it because we all shape it. Culture isn't something over there. Culture is something we are all building every single day, whether we're doing it on purpose or by accident, it's happening. So getting that understanding and then thinking critically about how you do change rather than following a methodology. Because I, I think that the ability to read the room and exactly the question somebody asked of how do you switch between that empowering to that leadership and, um, you know, kind of stronger leadership role. The fact that you're even asking that question means you're ahead of most people because it's the ability to navigate and switch between or apply both instead of it being a pendulum it's the ability to do that that will make brilliant change leaders of the future rather than I've got my Prince 2 or I've got my Prosky or I've got whatever it is and I'm going to I'm going to follow that. I, I think I think those days are gone because they, they're just not they're not tailored enough and you have to tailor it. And honestly, I'm a consultant. I'd love to invent something that we can just make loads of money out and just drop on every organization. And I only work in one sector, like, and even within one sector, the diversity of cultures and ways of working is huge. So how could you invent one thing that works? You can't. It's It's got to be about building the resilience and the ability and to read it and apply what it's needed. That That's the future for change, I think. Well, anybody got any thoughts on what I should do my PhD on? <laughs> because <laughs> I might have missed something entirely but that's what I would like to learn is how do you how do you build that framework for people to be able to do that in a way that it can be applied instead of it being something just completely rigid and, and fixed great stuff well I, I think that's the end of my questions so if there's anything that you'd like to to add Lucy I know we've got we've got eight minutes according to this so if there's nothing else that you'd like to say I'll, I'll start to wrap up and see if we've got any more questions I think the only other thing I would consider um, just for advice for people is do think about your resource um, because whilst I'm talking about a brave new world, um, I will come to the role of AI. I don't know the answer to that yet. I'm literally just piloting it at the moment. Um, whilst I'm talking about this brave new world where everybody knows how to do change, that is not where we are at the moment. And doing change well does take resource. So do do consider that. Don't make the habit. Don't Please don't walk away from this thinking, yeah, Lucy's right. Business as usual managers need to be able to do change. So let's just give it them. It, it's, not, it's not that easy. And it's a completely different mindset of, um, as I said, creating stability and consistency is a completely different mindset from change. So we, we need to figure out how to bridge that gap and we need to support people to bridge that gap. Um, what is the role of AI in the world of change? I don't know. So I am trialing at the moment Microsoft Pilot. Um, I am finding it. So actually, I, I did. I got it to do a report about the challenges in the housing in the housing sector because we've got a housing specialist at Truman Change, and I shared it with him. And I was like, "What do you think?" And his vibe was, "It's seventy percent there, but that that final thirty percent, it's not there." And that's how I feel it is with change. So I think what it will do is it will be brilliant for producing sort of timelines and producing documents. But I can't yet see that ability of what we're talking about. In, funnily enough, it would probably be able to replace a, a Prince 2 PMO pretty easily, but it's not um, that ability to really read the room and see and feel and get a sense of culture and figure out actually what's the right way here. When do I go hard? When do I go soft? Um, I, I, don't, I don't see that in it yet. 
but you know who knows we're, we're trialing it for various things and it's certainly very useful it's brilliant for research it's brilliant for um i got it to write me a paper summarizing academic research with references around hybrid working home working office working and what an organization would need to consider um which i did on behalf of the council and and it was good for that uh, it was really good for that but in terms of then really thinking about that for that council I don't think it's there yet, um, but there's much better people to ask than me on AI. I'm literally just starting to play with it at the moment. So um, I can see somebody else is trialing Copilot, yeah. So uh, keep your eye on the AI change chat coming in in 2024. <laughs> I won't be on that one. <laughs> <laughs> so if there's uh, nothing else from yourself, Lucy, and nothing else from anyone in attendance, I'll uh, I'll I'll wrap up. And um, I just want to say thank you again for for joining us today, Lucy. That was, and I know that you could have talked about that for about three hours. So uh, <laughs> so uh, no, thank you everyone for your really nice comments as well. So just before we finish, I just want to a date for the diary. Uh, on Friday, the 26th of April, we have our next change chat where we'll be focusing on the topic of comms and engagement. Um, and I believe Sarah is going to put the link into the chat for that. She just has. So thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, or alternatively, links can be found on our website or on social media platforms. So. Uh, as I mentioned at the start, you'll all receive an email with the copy of the recording as well as Lucy's report, which I recommend you give a read. It's it's really good. Um, and then finally, finally thing to say, if you want to have a chat with Lucy about today, about her report or about anything else that we at Truman Change offer, then please get in touch and um, we can organise uh, we can organise that with you. And so if there's no more questions and it's really good to see the messages coming in, really nice to see. So. I want to say again, thank you very much to Lucy and thank you very much for everybody for joining us. And uh, I look forward to seeing you at a future change chat. So thank you very much.